Hey guys, Stephanie here with the Aeroponic Tower Channel and today we're going to talk about how to maximize the amount of tomatoes you can grow on an aeroponic tower garden while also keeping it super simple. When I grew tomatoes in the soil, I always had to plant several plants just because there's so much loss with pests and disease and I don't have to do that on the towers. I also had to manage pruning to fight disease and trellising and it was always just a really big struggle and kind of robbed the joy out of growing food because honestly the more I've learned about myself over the years the more I would used to say that I loved to be a gardener and the truth is is I love to grow fresh food. I actually don't really love the stress of weeding and trellising and shovel compost and lay down ground cover and all of those things that's required when you're growing in the soil. It was always the food that I loved, not the actual labor of it. So that's how I got into aeroponic tower gardening. And one of the things that I stick to with these towers is keeping it super simple. So I like to find varieties of plants that are easy to grow, that are low maintenance, and that are gonna maximize the amount of food that we're bringing into our home because the goal is to replace the grocery store. So let me show you some of the amazing varieties I have found to grow on an aeroponic tower garden. I will put links below to all these different varieties in case you want to give these a try yourself. So let's dive into all things hydroponic tomatoes. So here's my harvest for today and I've been able to get at least two handfuls of tomatoes 
every other day for about the last month now and that's the goal i am not trying to grow enough tomatoes to can or to preserve them not this year anyway i'm actually testing some different varieties of roma tomatoes this year so that i can work to grow enough tomatoes to can and store up for the year but this year i just really wanted to get familiar with a lot of these different varieties um, test how they grow on the towers and really plan how to have fresh tomatoes year round. And what does that look like in a way that's easy and manageable? So there will be different tomatoes in these varieties that I am starting seeds with this week. And those will be the ones that I grow inside the garage during winter to make sure that we have fresh tomatoes to eat every single day. These are the varieties I've chosen to grow outside. I'm not sure if some of these will overwinter. I have hopes that I can keep a few of them in the garage still producing but we will just have to see how they transition from outside to inside because sometimes that can be pretty tricky if the plant is already producing fruit if you can get your plants mature enough to where they're about to produce fruit and then move them into the garage for the winter i have found that creates a better success rate than if it's already fruiting or even maybe past its prime and then you try to change the environment it doesn't always work out that well all right, and I'm playing Dodge the Sun to try and get this video out. I've been wanting to make this video for a long time. Uh, the weather just keeps getting in the way. We're actually experiencing some really huge rainstorms every afternoon, at least for the last two days. And it's overcast today and we're predicting to have another one of these really intense storms. So with these storms, they are blowing in, like it rained several inches in our garage because it came in sideways and so really, really intense. And I have gotten the question, can these towers handle weather and wind? And the answer is yes, they've been totally fine. I did lose one pepper plant that was planted in a top port that was already really tall and I didn't have it staked or tied with twine to the tower and it fell over and broke. But aside from that, everything else has been great. But when rain is coming, it will affect your tomatoes, not like it will in a soil garden. In a soil garden, when you are growing tomatoes, tomatoes like to be super consistent with watering. This is so much water inside this fruit. And when we go through a dry season in your soil gardens, and then all of a sudden it rains, these are gonna soak up a lot of water and they're going to split. That's a real common problem with gardeners who grow tomatoes in the soil. With the towers, we don't have that as much because we are giving them the right amount of water on a timer so they are getting consistent water from seed all the way to the fruiting process and that allows them to have this perfect blemish free no splitting tomato that's one of the huge advantages of growing on a hydroponic or aeroponic tower garden versus in the soil to me there's lots of advantages not having to fuss with trellising I use a tower garden grow cage here, but I actually don't have enough of these for all my tomatoes. So I just use twine to tie them to the tower and I will go around and look and see if anything's, you know, draping too much and might need a little bit more support. But that's a five minute job, like once a week. It's super simple. Where trellising in my soil gardens was a consistent upkeep. But you do want to harvest your tomatoes at the right time. And if there is big storms coming, you can harvest some a little bit early as long as they are blushing, meaning they're starting to turn colors. So this one right here is not fully ripe, but it's definitely in the blushing phase and has already started to turn colors. There's a chemical that causes that to happen. And as long as that chemical has already started that process, then you can harvest these and try and protect them from a storm that may be coming. And this will continue to ripen in the house. So several of these tomatoes I actually needed to harvest a couple of days ago to catch them in their peak. And I'll show you what one in its peak looks like so you know what to look for. But I wanted to record this video and with the storms I couldn't do that and some of the weather conditions I couldn't do that. And so one thing that did happen is you can see there is a little splitting at the bottom of this tomato. It's not huge. It's not like what would happen with the tomatoes in my soil gardens. I actually have some tomatoes in my soil gardens that were volunteers and they've gone through tremendous splitting in wear, but it can happen. There's one here too on a tower garden. So just be mindful of that. And then these are the tomatoes you want to eat first. I'm going to eat most of these in the next day or two anyway so just be 
mindful of that. If you know you have a lot of rain coming, it's a good idea to go out and harvest some of your tomatoes that are almost ripe or ripe. Don't let them go too long. So how do you know when it's ripe? It's going to have, so this one right here is more of an orangish color, and I'll get into the names of these in a minute so you know the different varieties and just more details about these. But this right here, it's got even color. It's a little bit light on the bottom, but almost evenly colored. This one is ripe. It's got no blemishes. I don't see any strain happening. These are like an heirloom type of variety. They're a hybrid to be a dwarf tomato, but it's still in the heirloom family, the um, tomatoes that they were bred with. So you're gonna get these kind of wonky, funky shaped tomatoes. This one right here is a different, same tomato, a little bit different variety. This one comes in red, and actually this one turns into a deep purple color when ripe. So just knowing what color your tomatoes are supposed to be when they're ripe will help you be able to determine if they are fully ripe when you harvest them. This is the right color for this tomato. This one actually isn't. This one gets into a dark purpley color and that will continue to happen on the counter or the window seal inside the house. This one is ripe. This one is absolutely gorgeous. It's variegated with those greens. So even though it has green on it, that's just the characters of this tomato. So knowing that I know I'm not waiting for that green to go away, this will get a little bit deeper purple if I let it sit on the counter. But because we have a little bit of splitting on the bottom, I'm gonna go ahead and eat this one today. And we actually like really firm tomatoes in our house. And the longer they sit and ripe, this one is actually really firm too, but they can get softer as they begin to over ripen. So that's another thing to look for too, is the texture nice and firm still. If it's hard, let me see if I can find, this one's really hard. This one's definitely not ripe. This is an amazing tomato. This, um, when it's ripe, it's one of those tomatoes you can cut into four wedges and serve with like an Italian salad. It's super delicious and firm and not super seedy, but this one's not ripe. And when I feel it, it's almost hard as a rock where this one that is ripe is little bit it's not squishy but it's definitely softer to the touch I would want to be more fragile with this one just naturally by touching it then my body would tell me to do with this one this one I'm not super worried about I can toss it around feels super solid so there are a few different varieties of tomatoes and to me optimizing what you grow on a tower garden and having the greatest success with the least amount of work starts by choosing the right varieties for growing environments of an aeroponic tower garden. And so what that looks like is there's a couple of different varieties of tomatoes. You have determinate tomatoes and you have indeterminate tomatoes. A determinate tomato is a determined size. It's only gonna get a certain height, let's say six feet for one in the garden, and it's going to produce any suckers that come off a sucker is where the joints of a tomato like two leaves it'll grow a new stem out of the center of that elbow and that will produce more fruit those whatever amount they produce that is it and then it's going to die back so it has a set number of fruit that it's going to produce and then the plant is done. An indeterminate tomato, however, which is typically more like your cherry tomatoes, which is why you don't see a lot of cherry tomatoes on my towers, and we'll talk about that in a minute because I know cherry tomatoes are a favorite of most people. But a cherry tomato is, is mostly an indeterminate tomato. And an indeterminate tomato is going to continue growing and growing and growing indefinitely until the plant becomes diseased and dies. Tomatoes actually are a perennial plant or maybe a biennial, I don't remember. They can keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Watched one guy did an experiment and he had one 30 feet tall, really cool. But most of us can't keep them alive long enough to make that a reality because they're very prone to diseases and as they start to fruit, their immune system of keeping the leaves and the stems healthy kind of deteriorates because all the energy is going into producing food. So an indeterminate is the one when you hear people talking about pruning their tomatoes, it's typically indeterminate tomatoes. Those are the ones that when that sucker comes off the elbow, they're removing it because they want all of the energy going into the main part of that plant and for maintenance purposes because that sucker can become a seven foot plant all on its own while you already have you know two or three or four plants going in the other direction so 
So when people are talking about pruning their plants, they're typically talking about indeterminate varieties that they're pruning. So that would be the difference in the two. Then we have two other classes of tomatoes and they are dwarf tomatoes and micro dwarf tomatoes. So all of my tomatoes that I'm growing are actually dwarf tomatoes. And originally when I came across this idea, I was like, oh, I want heirloom tomatoes. And you know, the idea of heirloom sounds amazing and I think people are afraid of GMOs and kind of get confused about what all of that means. A GMO plant, a true GMO plant, is not actually going to reproduce seeds for you. So you're not going to be able to purchase a GMO a genetically modified tomato. Those are unless you specifically bought one for that purpose which are like commercial growers who have a different goal in mind. So when we're talking about hybrids it just means that the original heirloom tomato, whatever that might be, was bred with a different type of tomato to start to alter the characteristics of the fruit or the plant or whatever it might be. Some are bred to be more disease resistant. Some are bred to be pest resistant. Some are bred to get, you know, funky cool tomatoes, right? Some are bred for size so that the plants aren't as hard to manage because their determined height is only like two to four feet. So that's what a micro dwarf is. These are plants that have been bred with heirlooms or other tomatoes so that their determined height is smaller than standard tomatoes. There is a project, there's a collective, it's called the Dwarf Tomato Collective or Dwarf Tomato Project, and I'll put a link to that below, of growers who are just really passionate about this movement and who are really investing into breeding tomatoes in a way that you get these more manageable, smaller plants that still produce an abundance of incredible tasting foods that are also disease resistant and easier to grow because they attract less pests and all of those things. There's also micro dwarfs and a micro dwarf and that's been a big movement lately with a lot of these um, countertop type growing systems that are coming on the market. A micro dwarf may only get 10 to 12 inches tall in size. And I will show you guys a micro dwarf on my tower here in a bit. And those are bred to be even smaller, to grow in a pot on your countertop under some LED lights in one of these little grow systems like the rise garden system you can grow tomatoes in or I have a click and grow system I'll be sharing a review on grow these little micro dwarf tomatoes and something like that are you going to replace the grocery store with a micro dwarf tomato no and some of them I feel have been bred out of texture and flavor I've had a few where the skin was super thick and tough and the flavor of those tomatoes just weren't that great. I grew one this year, the Tom Hat, which is a yellow variety and I actually really love yellow tomatoes. They're lower in acidity and sweeter to me. And I found it to be very, very enjoyable this year. So micro dwarfs are really a great option if you want to grow cherry tomatoes because they do offer cherry tomato varieties and if you wanna grow inside. So this winter I will be planting seven, maybe 14 micro dwarf tomato plants because I wanna see how much fruit I can get off of them if the goal is to have two pints, let's say, of cherry tomatoes over the winter to replace what I would purchase at the grocery store, then how many plants do I need to get that many tomatoes? I'm working on that and I will share that in a video when I find out the answer. So I'm gonna be growing micro dwarfs in the winter inside. I can grow some dwarfs and I may run an experiment and choose one of my favorites, but when you're getting into a tomato like this that has a larger fruit, these take a lot more energy, they take a lot more light, and when we're growing inside under artificial light, we just don't have the natural sunlight and you know when it rains it actually puts nitrogen on our plants. There's just a different environment outside and creating larger fruit works better outside. It just always is going to. But I may try to grow some of these smaller varieties. I'm gonna kinda look at the characteristics of some of these plants over the next few months and see which one I think would still be a heavy fruiting tomato to grow in the house. And I will keep you guys posted on what I find. And so are heirlooms better than hybrids? Some people think they are. So there's this idea that heirloom is better and that anything that's been altered by man is and not as healthy and I don't know the answer to that. I find it hard to believe that anything we eat or have access to is actually truly heirloom at this point. An heirloom 
gardeners will tell you they're only preserving the plant back to like 50 years some 100 years and there there's a few you can research that go back further than that and some that they have preserved for a thousand years but we honestly don't know what was the true original seedling that we can truly call heirloom so i don't fall into that camp that because it's an it's not an heirloom therefore it's less healthy just because I don't know I think our God's bigger than that and the fact that these two tomatoes can be crossbred I can pollinate this tomato with that I can pollinate the tomato on the left with the one on the right and I can create a new tomato you know that's not an accident that's all by design right so those are my thoughts on heirloom versus not heirloom I think if the option is to think heirlooms are the healthier option and then we can only get you know a basket full total over the growing season in our gardens or on an aeroponic tower garden because they are not resistant to pests and diseases and they're harder to grow and harder to maintain i don't see the benefit in that here the goal is to replace the grocery store this is better than organic food i can harvest it off the plant and have it on the table within minutes so now that we know there's determinate and indeterminate and micro dwarf and dwarf let's dive into what i chose to grow so i already shared that i chose to grow dwarf tomatoes i chose that because i wanted to have variety for one i didn't want to only be able to put two tomatoes on my towers and those two tomatoes get so big that i can't grow anything else and I wanted them to be easy to manage because tomatoes, to prune tomatoes and to handle tomatoes, you can get what's called tomato tar on your hand. They're actually really itchy like squash plants. So anytime I have to fuss with these, it comes at the expense of a little skin irritation and a lot of work. And my goal is to grow a lot of food with the least amount of work. So growing dwarf tomatoes, has absolutely worked for that. These have been super low maintenance. I have only done one pruning and I'll talk about the pruning for these and why I did it. And they just grow an abundance of tomatoes and I'm growing 21 different variety tomatoes on my towers. So that makes meals super fun too. I'm not interested in canning these this year. That may be something in the future where I want to get into preserving food more, but I don't really have to. If I can come out year round, even in the winter, even if I'm only growing cherry tomatoes, you can slice a cherry tomato for a sandwich. You can cook them down to make red sauce if you want to make pizza sauce or spaghetti sauce too. So we're really not limited just because the shape of this one is different than the shape of this one. It's about flavor that affects them. And yes, you know, the Roma is the ideal one to make your sauces with because they're less seedy and less, they have less moisture in them. But you know, that's just a rule of canners that's come over time. It's not the only way you can use tomatoes. I actually will take something like this with cherry tomatoes. I've got lots of little tomatoes in here and turn this into a red sauce for our dinner and it tastes amazing. And it tastes amazing to me because I'm not limited to the flavor of this one tomato. This tomato is gonna be amazing on sandwiches, but the scraps that we don't put on a sandwich are gonna go into the sauce. And when you mix that with a yellow Roma and this gorgeous orange, I forget the name of this one, I'll bring up the names in just a minute. You're gonna, I, you get just such a wide variety of flavor. I think you increase your nutrients that you're putting into your body. So that was my reason to. I want to be able to grow a variety of different tomatoes and by choosing the dwarfs I've absolutely been able to do that. So why did I prune some of my tomato plants? What happened is these have really large leaves and some of them we're just shading out some of the other plants I'm growing on this tower. So when I plant my towers, I put a plant in every single grow port. And what that means is that sometimes way down here tucked on the bottom, you're gonna have something, like I have a squash down there, that's not doing great because it's not getting enough sunlight because the tomatoes have filled up so much space. So I pruned a little of the leaves to free up space for this eggplant that's popping through. I've got some leeks growing in here. I've got some tomatoes or I've got some pepper plants right here that I wanted to have a little bit more sunlight. I've got lots of kale that's actually we've been eating off a ton and needs to come out and I'll put a new plant in there. So that was my idea on pruning. I don't even I didn't even do it. You'll hear people say they prune 
their leaves, not any of the suckers like I mentioned before. So any stem that I know is going to produce fruit and those are the stems that come out of the elbows. Those I'm not gonna prune. But when you hear people pruning the leaves, sometimes the thought is the less leaves, the more fruit. I've never, it may be true. I actually can't speak to that. I don't notice the difference, to be honest. And I don't know if it's worth the work to get, you know, three extra tomatoes. I just planted an extra tomato plant to make up for the difference. Um, and then you'll hear them talk about pruning the leaves to get airflow to prevent diseases. Now we don't even have to do that on the heirlooms either. I did not prune these to prevent diseases because I saw a lot of disease on my plants uh, and to get more airflow. It was just because I wanted some of the other fruiting plants on this tower to be able to have more sunlight. If you don't want to use every grow port, you definitely need to plug them. There are some things you can buy, some little foam covers, I think True Garden, I'll put a link below to them, has something. Because you don't want rain, as much rain as we're getting, you don't want rainwater coming into your tower consistently. That's going to throw off your nutrient balance and throw off your water to nutrient ratio. So make sure those are covered if you're not going to grow things in them. I just find it more fun to grow some things that may like shade in these dark tucked in places. So when this kale comes out this week, I'll juice the stems of it and everything so nothing goes to waste. And I may put some arugula in there, something or something like that. A plant that grows super easy, isn't high maintenance and would taste a little bit better the cooler it is and the shadier it is. So that is why I grew dwarf tomatoes, one for variety, one for ease. Don't have to do a lot of fussing with these. Even trellising has been super easy on the ones that I don't have a grow cage on. A lot of it's just either letting them grow to the ground or tying them up with some twine. And just to get the abundance of all the different colors and flavors. So let's discuss what varieties these are and I'll share my thoughts on each one. That's producing so far. I mentioned I have 21 different varieties. I do not have 21 varieties in this basket. I'm still waiting for some of those to mature, but we will dive into what I have here and what I'm familiar with so far. All right, and I went and grabbed my phone for a cheat sheet because I cannot remember all, all of these. But where I purchased my seeds is from victoryseeds.com and I will link that below. And I chose them because they had the largest variety of dwarf tomatoes available. Right on their website, you can go into where it says Dwarf Tomato Project, and it lists... All right, I had to move the camera out of the sun because even though it's overcast today, it was overheating. So hopefully the lighting is okay. So I'm gonna share with you guys some of the tomatoes I chose. And these, again, are from VictorySeed.com. Now, I like this company because it has so many varieties connected to the Dwarf Tomato Project. I like them because they're very affordable and each package is a mylar sealed package and is resealable. And what that means is these tomato seeds will last a lot longer. I only needed two seeds to plant all of the tomatoes you saw and a lot of the second seedlings I gave away because I only wanted one plant of each variety. Um, a couple of them I did do too, and there is some overlap in there because I just had open grow ports. So I planted both seedlings that started, but I only had to start two seedlings. And I just did two because I wanted to make sure that each one came up and I had 100% germination rate with these. So these packages are great because now I have seeds for the next couple of years actually, if I'm only using one or two seeds per year. So I am going to put these in the freezer and store them, but they come in these nice mylar bags. Then on the website, it has all the details about each. Do you see these bugs? For real? Like a minute ago it was, a minute ago it was a butterfly and that was cool but that fly was just invasive so let me pull up the ones that i know for sure i have growing to give you the names so this one right here is the adelaide festival that's the one that's the red with the green stripes in it and it, just if you go on here it'll tell you everything about this plant so actually reading this i thought all of my varieties were determinate and actually this one is indeterminate variety and it's adelaide festivals is a vigorous rugose regular leaf variety that produces fruit that are rich purple color 
and with the green stripes that ripen to an olive gold. They are medium sized, six to 10 ounces, smooth, oblate in shape, very juicy and tender with a delicious, well-balanced flavor that is neither too tart or too sweet. And it tells you who it was developed by. So that's good to know that I have some indeterminate tomatoes because that may mean I do want to prune some of these. Now, because they are dwarfs, I have yet to have any that I feel are super overgrown on the towers. But now that I know, that's something to be mindful of. So that is one of the tomatoes that I chose. This is a dwarf eagle smiley tomato, yellow tomato, yellow cherry tomato variety. And let's just read about these. It's a regular leaf plant. And regular leaf means it has tomato leaves. Some have potato style leaves on them. Um, looks like smaller version of a standard cherry type tomato reaching about five feet in height so they still get pretty high. Extremely productive which I have found that to be true and loaded with one ounce bright to golden yellow globe shaped fruit that is born in clusters of eight to ten tomatoes. In spite of their small size these little flavor bombs explode in your mouth with an intense sugary goodness that at first makes the fact that you're eating a tomato masks the fact that you were eating a tomato and lingers long enough that you are assuming that you did. It's outstanding for flavor, perhaps the best flavored of all the released dwarf cherry tomatoes to date. So that's why I chose a lot of these. I read the descriptions and chose them for flavor and texture and style. So I'm just going to mention a few and show you guys. I have the Adelaide Festival Tomato. That is this one with the green variegation that we discussed. I have the Roselle Purple Tomato. That is this variety. And I was saying these aren't quite ripe because they're going to get super purple. And that is the difference. It's red right now, but these mature into a darker. It's not like a true purple. It's just a deep, deep red that resembles a purple. Um, I have the Dwarf Eagle Smiley, which is the yellow. I have Fred's tie-dye tomato, which is another red and green tomato. I have the Banana Toes Roma here. That's this one. And I just pulled the ones that I knew. I have Dwarf Aubrey's tomato growing. And that's like a pear-shaped red tomato, closer to a cherry tomato. Um, let's see. I have the Dwarf saucy merry tomato that is a yellow and green variegated tomato and those are growing super prolific on my tower i have dwarf bendigo drop tomatoes dwarf edith stone tomato and then heart throb tomato is this super orangey colored one that I've been so, so impressed with. These are a little bit seedier, but I really, really like them. So that's not all the varieties I'm growing, but I wanted, but I wanted to show you a few. And I wanna talk about micro dwarf tomatoes and address a question I saw on a forum recently, just in case you have this same question. And the question was, what's wrong with my tomato plant? And it had some wear and was starting to look a little bit ick. So a tomato is going to have a lifespan. They're they're going to put all their energy into the fruit at some point they're going to maximize especially if it's a determinant and indeterminate maybe not so much it'll be the frost that takes that plant out but a determinant it's going to put all its energy into the determined amount of fruit that it wants to grow and then it's going to burn out and so that's what's happened with the micro dwarf and what was happening with her plants is that it put out all the energy it was done fruiting and those fruits were maturing and so the plant itself is starting to deteriorate and that's when you just want to make sure you have another seedling somewhere in another tower or in the same tower on a different side that is growing that's going to replace that mature plant so we want to be interval planting and always have fresh tomatoes if we're trying to have the goal of harvesting um, cherry tomatoes every single day so let me take you guys to look closer at that plant all right, and sorry for the lighting, guys. The sun is out, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But this is a micro dwarf. This is the Tom Thumb. And what she was asking is, why does my plant look like that, right? Her picture was a little bit of diseasing, spotting, browning. Doesn't look super great. This plant is just done. It produced all the fruit it's going to produce. It does have some flowers up here, and it's producing these tiny little things because it's past its prime. So what you want to do in this case, harvest all the fruit that's ripe. Once all of it's finished ripening, or at least has that pigment to it where it's going to ripe, 
you can harvest all those and let them ripen on the counter and then pull this out and start over. So that's a good sign it's time to trade out your microdwarfs and get a whole new healthy plant growing so you can stay in fruit. These do produce an abundance, but one plant's not gonna replace the grocery store. You would need, I'm thinking like seven minimum, if you're gonna feed a family of four, you know, maybe two pints a week. This is actually mature and you can see it split from all that rain. Mm, so good though, these are really good. The skin is a little thick on these, but they're so good. The flavor. All right, and the last tomato tip I want to chat about, and I had to move into the garage. It just got way too sunny and too hot out, but is pests. So in the peak of the summer, as we move into fall, you're gonna transition from not a lot of aphids to, that's when the aphids start to come out. They come out late summer, early fall. And so I have found a few aphids on my tomato plants. The way I manage those is just to check on my plants and remove any that I see. You can spray like a soap. Um, I recently learned you can spray a spray bottle of brewed coffee onto aphids and that kills them but really it's just maintaining them just check your plants brush them off as long as you stay on top of it there are still natural predators when you're growing outside so i've never really had a problem unless the plant is sickly or way past its age and maturity that they cause a problem when they're outside um, that's another thing things like the micro dwarf that are past their prime, it's best to take those plants out. Let the fruit mature as much as you can and then get that plant out of there. That is actually the plant that I found the aphids on to spread to other plants on that tower, just a little bit onto other plants on that tower, but they started with the micro dwarf and it's because the micro dwarf is not thriving its immunity is done just like our bodies when we have a weak immune system we're more susceptible to things attacking us and that's what's happening a tomato's past its prime it needs to go over matured plants cause health problems and start to attract attract pests and that's when you're going to see pests get out of control on certain plants and the other pests you're going to see are the squash bugs so squash bugs are not a problem when they are mature adults it's when they lay their eggs and these eggs hatch it's the baby squash bugs that can be so damaging to plants now they go after my squash but you will find eggs on your tomatoes and they can cause damage to tomato leaves so if you see those eggs make sure to pick that leaf and dispose of those and then the last one would be the green and I forget the name of it, the common caterpillar that attacks plants. Oh, what is the name? I'll link the name above because I forget the name of that one. Hookworm, wormwood, worm. I don't know. I'll, lay, I'll put the name above. But that particular tomato worm will do a lot of damage and eat a ton of leaves. Now, I have never seen those on my towers. I do have them in my soil gardens. I think a lot of those type of pests that have to crawl to find their food, those get eliminated when we have a tower if we're growing it on rocks or on a solid surface because solid surface in the summer gets extremely hot and a slug is not going to be able to make it from its habitat, which is under dead decaying leaves and things in the garden across that hot surface and attack your plants. So I went and did a little research and the hornworm eggs will be laid on the host plant like most caterpillars are. Um, so I'm not sure why they're not on my towers. I don't know if that particular moth just hasn't found its way to the towers or if for whatever reason it's more attracted to more traditional nature and wildlife environments, but I have yet to find a hornworm on any of my tomato plants. Now, if you noticed a lot of your leaves started disappearing, that's a clear sign of a hornworm because they will eat through entire sections of leaves and you can go out with a black light at night and shine it and find those or just dig around. I've been able to just look on my plants that are in the soil gardens and find them and remove them. And here you can just see the abundance of these tomatoes, some of them and all the different varieties 
And what's nice about growing so many different varieties is that lots of them are coming ripe right now, but then lots of them are just getting started. So it's going to keep me in tomatoes for a longer period of time and just offers a lot more diversity as far as flavors and textures. And they just grow so amazing, these dwarf varieties on the tower gardens. I highly recommend if you want to grow an abundance of tomatoes with ease um, to do the dwarf varieties. And I did go back and look at the varieties and I did plant four or five different cherry tomatoes. But what I noticed, which I found interesting, is that the cherry tomatoes were some of the last ones to start ripening. And then a few of the varieties, the cherry tomatoes just came in more like the size of a grape tomato. So more tomato than a typical cherry, but all of them tasted so amazing so far. And I'm just so happy with this, me with this method. And thanks for watching guys. I hope this video set you up to have as much success growing tomatoes on an aeroponic tower garden as I have been able to have. If you are interested in learning more about tower gardens, make sure to check out the description below. And thanks for watching. I'll see you guys on the next video.